Good afternoon and good evening, uh, everyone attending the session. I am truly honored to be a panelist at the Deepwater Virtual Forum. Um, my name is Jag Ning Tujam, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Ottawa, working with Dr. Bill Arnott. Today, I will be highlighting a few of the results of our study of matrix-rich deposits uh, from two different turbidite systems. This is something we have been working on for the past three years, and we submitted this to JSR for review in uh, September. Right, so I would like to begin by showing you some examples of matrix-rich sandstones from the very ancient, that is the Archean, to the more recent examples uh, from the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. As you can all see here, the mechanism resulting in the deposition of these beds has existed since the early years of the Earth. And the common aspect in all of these examples is the high presence of matrix and mudstone class. So what is the matrix? You know, in, in, in these two photomicrographs, of matrix rich sandstone from the Windermere and the Chlorodorm. The matrix is composed of all the detrital clay and silt particles. The matrix percentage on the left photomicrographs of both the examples would be between about 20 to 50%, and the right photomicrographs would be greater than 50%. So the reason for conducting this comparative study stems from a recent observation made by Angus et al. 2019 of an along strike depositional continuum of matrix rich strata consisting of relatively matrix poor muddy sandstone to a bipartite bed and then sandy mudstone over a distance of few hundreds of meters. So we were intrigued about the short distance change, lithophacies change, and wanted to compare it with another turbidite system of a different tectonic setting and timeline. So in addition, we were also curious to find out how these matrix or strata in both basins were vertically stacked. So before I present the results, here's a quick overview of the two study areas. The rocks of the Windermere were deposited in a passive margin setting. They are superbly exposed at Castle Creek in the Caribou Mountains and consists of vertically dipping basin floor strata of the upper Kaza group and slope channel deposits of the Isaac Formation. The Chlorodon formation was deposited in an elongated foreland basin, and the basin floor strata crop out vertically along the intertidal wave cut platform of St. Lawrence River and provide an excellent opportunity, just like the Windermere, to walk out these individual beds. Now let's look at what these rocks are like. In the interest of time, I would just point out that there are four main facies identified in both study areas and including matrix poor sandstone, muddy sandstone, bipartite bed with a lower sandy part and an upper muddier part, and uh, sandy mudstone. And notice that each of these facies is overlain by a thin bedded traction structured sandstone that is highlighted in those white dotted lines and a mudstone cap overlying that. So the question is whether or not there's an organized arrangement to these lithophacies. And the answer is yes. Just like the example shown by Angus et al. 2019, lithophacies were observed to form an along strike depositional continuum in both slope channel and basin floor strata of the Windermere and consists of matrix poor sandstone to muddy sandstone to a bipartite bed and then sandy mudstone over a distance of several hundreds of meters. What is even more interesting is that the range of grain size changes very little in the continuum. However, the modal grain size finds from the proximal to the distal end, shown from left to right. Additionally, the matrix content progressively increases from left to right. Here, these depositional continuums are interpreted to reflect sedimentation at a high angle to the main flow. Interestingly, in the chlorodorm, which is a different tectonic setting, Similar along strike depositional continuums were observed over the same horizontal distance. More remarkable is the textural changes, which were also similar. That is, the range of grain size showed negligible change throughout, but the modal grain size decreased from the proximal to the distal end of the continuum. As for the orientation of the continuums here, they are interpreted to reflect sedimentation parallel to the flow and mark the downflow terminus of the flow. 
Another very interesting result that came out of this, this study was that regardless of the basin type and the outcrop orientation, the lithophagies transitions shown here from light green to dark green when normalized with respect to the total length of the transect showed that each facies transition occurred in equally proportionate strike length, uh, along strike length. So where do these matrix with strands, uh, sandstone occur stratigraphically? In these two aerial photographs from both study areas, strata consisting almost exclusively of matrix rich beds shown here in green, typically underlie sandy straddle elements shown here in yellow, such as slope channel and basin floor terminal space. Now it's because of this common association that we have interpreted it to be related to the activation of local transport system caused by an upflow avulsion. So avulsion, creates an unconfined plain wall jet that lo locally scours the mud-rich interchannel area and charges the flow with fine-grained sediment, including clay, silt, uh, particles, in addition to low-density mud class. This instantaneous incorporation of fine-grained sediment results in the rapid conversion of turbulent kinetic energy, TKE, into potential energy needed to maintain particle suspension. Now this, Dramatic reduction of TKE causes the sediment suspension to collapse, forming a negligibly sheared suspension that deposits a systematic succession of lithophages along the margins of the flow, in the case of the Windermere, and in the downflow terminus of the flow, in the case of the corridor. Now, the sedimentation process begins by depositing most of the coarse grain sediment, resulting in the formation of matrix poor sandstone and muddy sandstone in zone one. As particles continue to settle, due to volume continuity, there's an upward displacement of interstitial fluid and slowly settling fine grain particles. This increases the abundance of fine grain particles in the upper part of the suspension, resulting um, in the development of a two-part suspension, which ultimately forms a bipartite bed in zone two. So further particle settling an increased upward abundance of fine leads to thinning and eventual termination of the lower part of the bipartite bed. The upper part of the suspension then continues for several tens of meters, depositing sandy mudstone in zone three, which thins and then finally pinches out. So this is what happens to a single matrix bridge bed. What about the vertical succession of these beds? How do they stack in time? So in both study areas, Similar lithophages tend to preferentially stack and build up bed sets two to nine beds thick. Additionally, within a discrete bed set, individual beds undergo a transformation from one facies to the next in the along strike depositional continuum at about the same along strike position. In addition, in the Windermere, we noticed that at any along strike position within a bed set, the D90, the coarse fraction, and the D50, which is the median of the grain size distribution, subtly yet progressively decreases upward. In the chlorodorm, on the other hand, the grain size distribution, including D90, D50, and the mode showed a slight but an abrupt decrease only in the topmost bed of each bed set. So these observations collectively suggest that beds within a discrete bed set are more or less texturally self-similar and therefore deposited from flows with similar hydraulic and compositional character, although exhibiting minor but nevertheless progressive decrease in the flow energy. Now, this raises the obvious question whether this self-similarity is a consequence of multiple flow events or a single flow event with multiple pulses. Now, considering the spatial and temporal regularity that I've just highlighted in the previous few slides, the bed sets of the bed sets and superimposed on it, the gradual waning nature, which is indicated by the upward finding trend, make it problematic for these beds to have been deposited by multiple turbidity currents. The alternative is that the self-similarity is caused by multiple pulses of a turbidity current. Here, our idea of turbidity current pulsing stems from the recent monitoring of turbidity current in a Congo Canyon. So unlike typical lab-generated surge type turbidity currents where they reported uh, that uh, the turbidity currents consists of, in the Congo Canyon, the turbidity current consists of a fast-moving frontal cell and a trailing body and tail. 
Now the difference in density and velocity between the frontal cell and the rest of the flow caused the frontal cell to outrun the trailing flow. Now carrying this idea forward and considering that the Congo Canyon observation was limited to submarine canyon and at least some of the turbidity currents that are capable of reaching further downslope and even onto the basin floor is uh, it is it is possible that turbidity currents as it continues to be stretched the dense frontal cell eventually becomes detached from the rest of the flow and forms a separate turbidity current with the detachment of the head the remaining turbidity current is cut off from the major source of sediment which then causes the flow to dilute and slow here at the leading edge of the flow it is subjected to elevated fluid pressure causing it to move more slowly than the trailing part of the flow, which then feeds the sediment forward into a newly developing head. Um, the increased density in the new head would eventually cause it to accelerate and erode the seafloor, forming a new frontal cell that then detaches from the main flow and becomes a second discrete turbidity current. With time and distance downslope, this process is possibly repeated several times, creating multiple surges from a single throw event. And accordingly, each bed in a bed set would correlate with a single surge and the progressive decrease in the grain size would reflect the gradual long-term waning of the parent turbidity current. So overall, this study has allowed us to understand that there is an organized arrangement occurring at both bed and bed set scale. In addition, we have observed predictable and systematic arrangement at the straddle element scale, which is detailed in the manuscript. Um, so yeah, with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and thanks to all the research partners of the Windermere Consortium.